you can live up to half of what you just said there. Um, so that's before we had three hours to talk, so I'll try to keep it. <laughs> I see all these drop jaws all of a sudden, right? So I was like, ah. no, I'll keep it less than an hour. In fact, before I get out of here early. But anyway, um, it's a pleasure to be here. As uh, Sylvester mentioned, I'm Terry Harris, uh, managing partner of McConnell and Asbury, an E-Town alumni. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about sort of my history, my story. Um, before I do, I understand that we both, most of our business students here, and I might just kind of go around and show of hands to have an understanding of uh, who's in the audience. I do have, to have three graduates over here. They're sitting over here. Uh, actually, Bill Unst uh, is a CPA as well, and he and I did a little business together back in the day. And it's nice to have you guys here as well. But let me see how many accounting students, how many accounting students are in first? Okay. Leave your hands up. Probably business students. Can you raise your hand if you're a business major. Okay, so the majority. And how many seniors do we have in the room? Let's see, a couple. Juniors? Okay, most of you and seniors, great, great. This, this hopefully will be helpful to you as, as I go through this. I, I tell my topic today, building relationships on a business network, because one of the things that I've found in my career uh, over 37 years, I guess, is that the relationships you build and the network that you build over time will have a great influence and impact on your career, on your business development opportunities in your career, and just friendships. I mean, you'll, you'll gain amazing friendships through these relationships you develop over time. Uh, my story was, um, I started as a, uh, I grew up on a farm. I was this kind of awkward farm kid. I mean, the only relationships we had outside of the other farmers was I went to church, you know, so we people at church, but basically we were farm kids. And one of the things we learned from the farm, though, was how to work hard. My dad was a hard worker. My grandparents were hard workers. They were farmers. And uh, I was one of four boys, so my dad had to build in, you know, like workforce, our workforce. But my dad was also very entrepreneurial, and I got a little of that in my blood as well. My dad was a guidance counselor. His whole, his, well, he's a teacher and a guidance counselor. So my career in public accounting and my career in accounting was really because my dad said, son, you're pretty good at numbers. Take a couple accounting courses. This works for you. Maybe you want to think about going to college or accounting. So that's what I did. So my dad, because he was also my guidance counselor, directed my career. But he, my father probably, in his career, never made more than $40,000 a year as a guidance counselor and teacher, which back in the day, he just didn't make that much money. But my dad made most of his money over time by being entrepreneurial. He invested in real estate. He bought little businesses. He made them successful. He bought apartments. Again, he had a built-in workforce of four sons. So we worked hard. But, but the entrepreneurial side of his life influenced my life. So I went to Elizabethtown College for accounting, majored here in accounting. Uh, in my junior year, my Texas semester junior year, uh, I did an internship. That internship was with the firm that I'm with today, which is amazing. So I've been with this firm for 36 years. Now, in current lingo, it's probably a dinosaur. You guys probably don't aspire to be the same firm that many years. But I can tell you it's given me huge opportunities for things that are fun, things I can do as an entrepreneur, and I've had just a tremendous career. So my internship at uh, McConnell and Asbury was when I was a junior, the last eight months. I had planned when I, became, when I came to E-Town, in fact, one of the main reasons I came to E-Town was they had an internship program. And how many of you in this room have been on internship so far? Uh, let me ask just one volunteer to comment on the value of the internship that you've been on. Any of you guys? Good. You just have a lot of exposure to senior level executives. Maybe if you're not doing a bunch of jobs, you get exposed to it so you know what you're going into and what you have to report in the future. Did you do that? What year did you do your internship? Sophomore? Uh, yeah, sophomore. sophomore. And did you come back with a better understanding of the books when you saw what happened in the real world? You can apply what you learned in the classroom because you have you know, an image of what you see in the offices and what executives are actually doing. I mean, I came back from eight months in my accounting internship inspired. I mean, I, suddenly it's all made sense, all the stuff that I was learning the deficit credits and the application of consolidated income statements and uh, consolidated tax returns. I mean, it all sort of gelled after my internship. So the internship for me was just huge. In fact, at the time, there was a professor named Ed Bidding, who was the chair. <coughs> you gentlemen will remember Ed. Uh, he was the chair of the accounting and business department. Now, Ed didn't think I was probably the A-plus student, 
I, I had a little bit of a social side to me. So I probably wasn't exactly a bookworm. I did okay. But, um, but Ed, Ed, when I got back from my internship, Ed would call me in class and say, Karen, can you explain this to the rest of the class? I'm explaining it from my perspective, but you've just been out in the real world. And you can explain this better. And so I would sometimes explain stuff to my interest that Ed thought I could explain better. But anyway, the, the internship was very helpful and the, the real world experience is extremely helpful. So I graduated from E-Town, uh, it's gonna sound like a long time ago, 1978, and uh, 20 years old. And with and they uh, I started at the firm. We had eight people then. Our firm today is about 80 people. And um, when I started, I uh, you know dove right in. You know, hard worker. Then bring on coach and ready to play. You know, that's how I was. Uh, by age 27, I was a partner at the firm. Doing this partner at street firm uh, then and, and since. But as my career continued, I got you know on the personal side, I got married. Married a CPA. Go figure. Had three kids, two of which are adopted, but my entire career has been with McConnell and Asbury. And it's given me the opportunity to do so many entrepreneurial and fun things. <coughs> I was a millionaire by age 41. With my, did I get anybody's attention on this? Yeah, okay. With my partners, I've started businesses, built businesses, bought businesses, I sold businesses, I started businesses that were bad businesses, or businesses. So you don't always get over them. But I've had the opportunity to work with talent and people. I've traveled to 30 countries, almost every state in the union. I've had a pretty good career, pretty good life. I've been fortunate to enjoy good health, which as you get older, you realize good health is something we all take for granted. If you have your health, you have so much. So by all measures, I've been successful. And I would say, when people ask me, how are you doing, Terry? I say, I'm living the dream. And I'm, life is good. So what, what can I, uh, and what words of wisdom can I impart on you today? What tidbits can you take away from my life and my success? Well, first of all, I would say, uh, know yourself. Know who you are. Know what your strengths are. Know what your weaknesses are. Now, what tools, have any, how many of you have ever heard of like Martin Spriggs or MBTI? Martin Spriggs, MBTI. Have any of you taken those and taken those as well? Okay, Colby Index, anybody familiar with Colby? Okay, taking this, yes, no. Strength finder, anybody familiar with strength finder? <coughs> rules, okay. Well, my favorite is strength finder. And it's embedded in our culture. Um, back in the early 2000s, a guy named Mark, Marcus Buckingham for the Gallup organization wrote a book called First Great Laws Rules. There was a study on management of over 100,000 people in management positions. And why people left great companies. Why do people that were in a great company, why did they leave this company? And what what was the recipe for growth with your within your career? And what they discovered was in first break of rules and the subsequent book, which was called Now Discover Your Strengths, and then a couple more books like this one called Strength Based Leadership, is that we all have talent, we all have skill, we all have strengths, but we also have weaknesses. But if we focus our attention on those strengths, we will have exponential growth as opposed to focus our time on our weaknesses, we'll have modest growth. So in our firm, we do the Strength Finder Index, which is an online test you can take. If you don't buy the book, it costs you something, but you can buy a book. And the back of the book has a little thing with your own secret code. So you can have the uh, Strength Finder Index. But in our organization, what we try to do is understand who we are as individuals. So our people, when they come into the organization, they take the Strength Finder Test. And it gives them the top, top five strengths. And what I've found in my career is if you know yourself, you know your strengths, then you can surround yourself with people who are stronger in the area, in areas that you are, that supplement your weaknesses and you supplement their weaknesses, so you're stronger as a team. So in our partner group, for example, let me, let me just back up. In the, in the strength finder process, there's basically four buckets that they put your strengths into, relational, uh, strategic, execution, which is the doers, and then influencer. In my leadership team at McConnelly and Asbury, I'm the relational guy. I'm the guy out there having fun. You know, that, that's me. <laughs> my one partner is the, is the execution guy who gets it. If we have a project or something's done, I say, great, here you go. Done. And he gets it done. 
And then it's Kurt. Kurt's our strategic thinker. All the way out there. Okay, come on back to the curve. We gotta do some stuff here. Good. But if I get something that Kurt, it's not gonna get done so if I get to Greg. And if you give it to me, I'll talk about it a lot probably because I'm relational. But it won't get done the way it would with Greg. So so we've learned a little bit about each other, and as you know yourself, you can begin to say, these are my strengths, this is what I can bring to the table, this is the talent I can bring to my employer, the, the relationships that I build. But surrounding yourself with people that are better than you are in some areas, stronger than you are, more talented than you are in other areas, I think is, is just a great thing. Um, another thing I would say in this whole area of knowing yourself is you're going to have opportunities come your way right? throughout your life, throughout your career. I take advantage of those opportunities. You don't always have to say yes, but before you say no, be sure no is the right answer. You get all kinds of opportunities come your way. The only reason I've been so successful is because the relationships that I've built over time, business opportunities come out of those. And these business opportunities turn into exciting, fun, challenging, but with a team working on these different areas, I mean, we've just been generally very successful. Another thing I would say, too, in this whole area of knowing yourself and working in your career is education. You know, we, uh, we hire um, with three to five people a year. We have about six internships, interns a year. Um, sometimes we see folks come in from college, you know, they run away think they've got to be the next managing partner in five years. Well, it doesn't quite work that way in the real world. I mean, uh, if you started Google or something, maybe that's the case. Uh, and there's lots of opportunities <coughs> in the cyberspace to do stuff that's pretty cool and you can get there really quickly. But uh, at least in the, in the accounting world, you know, all these things take time. So be patient because relationships take time, success, success takes time. Um, again, around these whole, the whole area of relationships, uh, get involved in organizations that you like. I mean, I have some of our folks that get involved in organizations. They don't really like it. They just decided they, were, they needed to get involved in an organization, but what, they weren't passionate about it. So what happens is they don't invest in it. They don't, really, you know, they don't make the investment in that organization that, that will help them in their career. So get involved in organizations you like, and then get involved in organizations that can help you in your career, where you can connect with other business people. But if you get involved, give 150%. In other words, volunteer, join committees follow through. Because the more you invest, the more you get back. It's true in every single organization I've been involved in in my entire career. And you get to know people. And people get to like you. They know how you operate. And trust me, people do business with people they like. I'm big, personally, in want treating people with respect. I mean, Cole Cole said, do to others if you have to do to you. I think it still applies today. Value people's time. Because people's time is one of the most valuable commodities that any of us have. And so often, we waste people's time. We don't value their time. We want people to value our time. Sometimes we don't value their time. Respond quickly to phone calls. You know, a firm's 24-hour requirement for your turn of phone calls. And remember things about people. Make notes in your iPhone. How, and now, this is an iPhone, right? How many iPhones do we have? Go up your iPhone. Everybody have an iPhone? Let me say, who, does, who has a non-iPhone, like a, whatever. Okay, so about a third. Okay. Well, I've got iPhone back. <laughs> and um, I have your iPhone, open your contacts. <coughs> and uh, go to the very bottom where it shows the number of contacts you have in your iPhone. How many of you use your contacts? Do you use them? Yeah. What's your number? What's your number of box? Yeah. And if you have curious how many, how many of you people you have in contact? So this is not necessarily a test to see how many people you know, but it's an indication of when you're using your contacts in a way to help you build your network and build your business relationships. So in your contacts, if you push the very bottom thing that says number on the far right hand side, they show you how many number, how many people are in your contacts. Who has over two thousand? Three thousand? Four thousand? By the, he's, he's the winner right here. All right, I have, have 3,800. About 90% of my contacts this year are related to business in some way or other. I mean, I get business cards. I'm big on business cards. I take the business card and make some notes on them. I input them in to my contacts. And then if I want to 
Like I, I go back and forth to New York, for example. I'll meet somebody on the train. Interesting person, they're doing business in New York, we're doing business in New York. I'll just put the name in with their, off, their, uh, off the card. I'll put met on the train to NYC October 15th. Business, business is a <coughs> professional search. They do high-end executive search. So next time, I can't remember this guy's name, right? It's like two minutes after I meet him, maybe, because my, you know, I'm getting old, right? So he, he lives a little in the short-term memory. Gentlemen, can we agree on that? Yes, man. I hear a few amens. Um, but what you can do with this tool, which is like my hard drive right here, this is my brain hard drive for all my relationships. I can just search NYC. Up pops <coughs> ten people that with NYC that met on the train that I know from New York, 20, 20 people, whatever it is. But you can Google, you can search your own thing for, just to help you in your relationships. And if you're going to a client, for example, and let's say it's the, the owner of a large meat manufacturing company, for example, mm -hmm. I might pull up Craig's name and say, Oh, that's right, his wife's name is Donna. Oh, and he's got one son. He's been He's in school, you know, I have all this information in my iPhone about that person, so I can make that personal connection. And personal relationships in business are just huge. Because people do business with people they know, they like, and they trust. I've been doing business all around the world. Last year I was in Hong Kong, flew to Hong Kong. From Hong Kong, flew to Singapore, from Singapore, flew to Vietnam, Vietnam, <coughs> Cambodia, Cambodia. Huge <coughs> trip, amazing trip. The reason I went to Hong Kong is because there's a CPA firm in Hong Kong. I know the managing partner really well. Great guy. We spent two days together. He drove me around in his Ferrari in Hong Kong. Pretty cool. I don't know Ferrari. But Brad Brown was pretty cool. From there, I went to Singapore. I have contacts in Singapore. He's the former, former, the former tax director for J.P. Morgan. Well, how did I know the former tax director for J.P. Morgan? We don't have to J.P. Morgan. Well, I met him on the veranda out in uh, Newport Beach, California, Public and Hill, watching the sunset. His wife, he and his wife sat down, and uh, he's, I said, where are you, where are you guys from? Oh, I bought him a drink, because yeah, the sunset was beautiful, so it was my wife. Bought him a drink, and uh, I said, where are you guys from? Singapore. <coughs> oh, I'll call him Singapore next year. We'll have to get together. So, email him, Bob, come to Singapore. Right at this time, he's like, we'll do, we'll do dinner. So he didn't look at that thing. But it's these connections you make over time. Now, when I met Bob, made all these notes about, I just got his business card, so I had to remember what his wife's name was, which after a couple glasses of wine, watch the sunset, was not the easiest thing to do. But nonetheless, you just take, take, the, take the initiative, take the time, make the notes so that you can make that connection. All right, so I'm way off my notes now. So let me, let me try to bring this back in. When I said I had three hours, I really was kidding, because when I timed myself this morning, I had 18 minutes. I thought I said, no, oh, this is not a presentation. Oh, I can, I can talk for it. <laughs> well, we talked a little bit about social media, but not much. Uh, LinkedIn. Uh, how many of you are on LinkedIn? I mean, this is the sort of the, the social network for uh, the business community. Uh, I have over 500. I don't even know how many. I have people on LinkedIn, but um, I bet I've only reached out to two people, three people, maybe five people in my entire career on LinkedIn. But I have over five, six hundred people because uh, people reach out to you. Um, before I came today, actually, there was a um, <coughs> there was a little piece written by a guy named Michael O'Donnell, <coughs> managing director of Thesis Ventures. He wrote this little, wrote this little uh, article I thought was pretty interesting. It's called, Why I Won't Accept Your Invitation on LinkedIn. Right now on LinkedIn, I have like 20 pending people on my screen because I don't know these people. So they reached out to me to connect. It's just a generic, generic, I know you from business, whatever. And if I don't know you, I, I, I just don't connect to you. If I know you, if I do. This gentleman, let me just read this to you. I get about five or six requests to connect with people on LinkedIn every day. I consider each and every request in the spirit I hope others will consider my request to connect with them. I used to accept invitations only from those I knew, or at least have met. I've been in that policy because I myself have requested to connect with people on LinkedIn that I do not know and I have not met because I think that the basis for mutual interest. It only seems fair that I should thoughtfully consider requests from people whom I do not know yet. I review the profile of each person who invites me to connect. I generally accept invitations that are authentic. 
and relevant to my professional endeavors. The reasons I reject invitations were for the following seven reasons. Number one, no picture. For the picture is an icon or a company logo. I'm looking to connect with real people, not people with no faces or inanimate objects. I value relationships with people, not entities. If I want to follow your company, I will do so in the company section of LinkedIn. I cannot know you or trust you. I cannot see you. I need your face and name. And this gets back to the whole thing I was talking about earlier. With social media, it has made it so easy to connect. But the personal relationship is still lacking. And that's where you need face-to-face, telephone call, follow, and things like that. Number two, reasons why I won't accept your invitation. Incomplete or sparse profile. If you can't take the time to list your work history, educational background, and other information to help you learn who you really are and what you're all about, why do I need you in my network? If I know nothing about you, I certainly can, can't do anything for you, nor do you for me. Number three, few connections and no recommendations. I'm immediately suspicious of invitations from people that have few to if no connections. Such a pro profile screams scammer. Number four, your invitation reads, I'd like to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn. That's standard one, right? If you can't take two minutes, two minutes to write, hey Mike, I know we don't, don't know each other, but I think we have some mutual interests or connections. And I would value you in my network. Then I will take one second to collect your success. Number five, you lied about how you know me. Your LinkedIn invite says you're a former colleague, classmate, and we've done business together, and we haven't. Well, that's just a bad way to start a relationship. Number six. Your connection invitation was preceded by an email that was essentially a sales pitch for your company. And number seven, your profile title says you are a visionary, or you have 10,000 plus connections, which intimates that I might, must be an adult because I have no vision and fewer connections than you. Anyway, be you, be real. One good connection is better than hundreds or thousands of random names. I thought that was a pretty good article, especially in this day and age where we're using so much social media to make the connections with us. <coughs> it's not so common for that. I mean, you guys are, you are the social, social media generation, right? Um, yeah. Thoughts, comments? All right, we're going to have a Q&A at the end, but let me continue. Let's talk a little bit about some of the relationships that drove my career. As I mentioned, I've been growing up farm, but the most significant of the relationships we had were in church. Uh, a gentleman named Clarence Asbury attended my church. He, he was one of the founding partners of the Conway Asbury. Now, Clarence would drive, <coughs> Clarence was in his mid 30s, would drive to church in the Mercedes, which I thought, oh, these guys in the county field must be okay. Showing up in the blue Mercedes. Um, but anyway, um, his family knew my family, we made a connection. So it was time for me in my um, my sophomore year in college to think about the internship, he naturally reached out to Clarence. Clarence, despite my long hair, thought it was good enough to come work with the firm. I didn't even get a haircut, but, um, which I did. But, um, but he gave me a shot, you know, he gave me a chance, and I worked there eight months. And um, then when I graduated, he offered me a job. But uh, Clarence was in a significant relationship in my life got me started in my career. And I know each of you have relationships in your life that got you to where you are today. And, and it's what's, what we're talking about today is keeping your network current, keeping it up to date, continuing to add to it. So I graduated from E-Town, got involved in organizations I wanted to get involved in, which was my church and the Christian Businessmen's Committee, and also the Estate Planning Council. Now, while I didn't really have an interest in estate planning, I mean, I, I was in estate planning, I didn't want to train in estate planning. This was a place where you could connect with attorneys, <coughs> insurance people, business people throughout Central Pennsylvania. So I got involved because it was a good place to connect. And I got, I got involved with committees. I was ultimately president of that organization. But in that, in the early years, when I was in my early 20s, I met a gentleman named, named Denny. He and I had a good connection. And he said, hey, why don't you join our monthly networking group? Like, okay, sounds fun. Lunch, once a month, I'll make it be right? Take advantage of the opportunity. <clears throat> through Denny, I met a guy, through that networking group, I met a guy named Bob. Uh, Bob, he was already an established professional engineering firm, and now is one of the largest 
uh, engineer, engineering firm in uh, Central Pennsylvania. Uh, they've been a client of ours for about 25 years. Again, I met Bob through Jenny, through these things like <coughs> But all these connections just continue to propel my own career. Bob then said, hey, Tim, I'm in an investment club. Would you be interested in being an investment club? I'm like, absolutely. I'll be in an investment club. Investment club about 12 or 13 guys, one room. Uh, all business owners, all leaders in their business. Again, my network is expanding. By within 10 years, over half that investment club is a client of mine. Why? People do business with people they know, they like and they trust. One of the most interesting stories, I think, in my career um, was a story about a guy named Sal. Now, my daughter was 12 years old, <coughs> playing recreational soccer. I mean, how I many girls played real soccer? Real soccer players out there? One or two? Yeah, a So, recreational soccer, you know, it's, it's fun. It's a uh, <coughs> competitive. And my daughter's pretty good. Um, but we didn't really care for the coach that she had when she was 12. But we saw another coach on the field with his team. And they looked like they were having a lot of fun. They were, new, they're, they're, they were they're just better players. They um, were winning more games. So, I said, well, my we want Sal, that guy named Sal. I overheard his name Sal. We want Sal as our coach next year. So we called next year, got Emily and Sal's team. Loved Sal. Went the whole summer playing soccer. I was on the sideline for every game, every track. I was there. You know, I was always there. Got to know Sal very well. At the end of the season comes around. They'd be, we're all having a little social thing with the girl that, at the end of the season. And I'm standing beside Sal and we get to talk to him. So, uh, he, well, the short version of the story is that it turns out Sal was the CFO for a large Fortune 1000 company in our region. I didn't know this. I didn't chat with Sal for a while. But we built a relationship of rapport and life and trust. And so a year later, Sal said, I'd like you to come into our organization. We'd like to take a look at what services you can provide to us. Three years later, we were doing a million dollars of a business with this Fortune 1000 company, all because of a relationship I developed on the soccer field, on the soccer sidelines, with a guy named Sal, who I didn't know what he did. So these, these relationships that you build, they're built on trust, they're built on like, they take you like, places that you wouldn't expect, places you would never have thought. Much like a guy named out in Newport Beach, when I got to Singapore, very cool to get there, you know, you know, it's, it's just fun. Um, I've, been, I've been fortunate because of these relationships, to be invited on a number of boards. I served on Habitat for Humanities board. Uh, of course, I'm a real estate, I'm sure the intro, I'm a real estate guy. I've done a lot of real estate. I still do a lot of real estate at Fort Worth One of the guys president of that board when I was the treasurer, uh, is now one of our largest clients, top five clients of our fund. I served on the Theater Harrisburg board. Am I a theater guy? Not so much. I mean, I get a theater <coughs> sometimes. But it was a great place. Again, somebody that I knew, that knew me, said, Terry, I think you're great on the board. Are you interested? And any kind of an opportunity, my view is, take it for <coughs> some compelling reason or moral reason that you just can't do it. Now, sometimes you get really busy, but that's that's a whole other topic. I'll come back and speak on time management. But um, you take advantage of those opportunities. I'm, I'm currently on WITF TV, Radio TV's board. Been a great run. In fact, Carl Strickland was here earlier on. We saw Carl come in, but Carl and I on the board together. Again, just all these connections. Um, one of the most interesting boards I just went off in May that I was on for six years with an uh, organization called Prime Global. It's an association of accounting firms across the world. So there's about 350 accounting firms are across the world. Uh, my connections in Hong Kong, Singapore, all these guys are part of Prime Global. This organization has allowed me to travel the world. They create great friendships, great relationships, great business contacts. It helps our clients that are local, that have global operations, gets them connected to people in other countries. So it's been a very interesting award. And then Capital Cross, I think you mentioned as well. All right, building your own network, a couple things. Again, I mentioned business cards. Uh, scan them into your iPhone, make notes, follow up. Um, it's a little article I'll read here, here in a second, but. 24-hour follow-up is really important after you meet somebody. You want to do it within 24 hours. You have a connection, follow-up with an email, text, phone call, set up a lunch if you can, but it's that 24-hour time period that shows that you're interested. Get involved in your community organizations that have a mission you're passionate about, where you can use your talents. 
the accident and social media side for the same one uh, this is being used. Stay in front of the people you want to connect with or help your kind of career. Always be genuine. I mean, people don't want to feel like you're, they're being used. So you want to be genuine in these relationships. The people that you're going to have the most opportunity to do business with are within 10 years of your age. When I graduated from college, I noticed I looked very young. So I got a lot of a lot of this attitude from the clients I was working with who were 20 years older than me. He's just a kid. Well, can you, how can you help me in my business? He's still like in the years. How can you give me advice? So you have to overcome that. But you need to be confident. And you have to, you know, that's something that comes over time. But confidence is huge <coughs> in these relationships. But start building your network early. It's those college, it's those high school relationships that later turn into business and career opportunities. <coughs> So let me just wrap this up by saying a few things. Uh, number one, uh, be yourself, know yourself, always be respectful of others. As you build your network of relationships, take notes, take the initiative to and stay in touch, make it personal, not just social media. Know what your talents and weaknesses are. Take, use one of these uh, strength finders, Colby Index, one of those testing, MBTI. Be confident, I mentioned that. Be patient. Relationships take time, success takes time. As an accountant, I've had to serve them, so I always say live within your means. Don't buy the new Mercedes when you graduate from college. Now you can, but I'm just saying, I, my first car was the only car I ever had a car loan on. After that, I quit <coughs> cash because I just, don't, I just don't want to be in debt because it's just another burden. So live within your means. It's real simple, you guys are accountants. It's income minus outflows equals savings or what you do, spend money on. So you always want to have that to be a positive number, right? Simple math. Uh, so, and, surround, and finally, surround yourself with people that complement your strengths and supplement your weaknesses. There was a, um, an article on the uh, ASCDA website uh, just this, two weeks ago, and it says, uh, the title of the article was Socializing for Success at Work. And they have eight tips, their top tips on socializing at work. And this is from a, a research firm. Number one, walk and talk. Take a five minute break from your desk every 90 minutes. Walk around and say hi to a coworker. Number two, prep for your intro. Practice a short elevator speech about who you are, what you stand for, what your interests are, when you know you're going to be meeting new coworkers. Number three, be strategic. Introduce yourself to people you don't know and who interest you or have a job you'd like to know more about. Number four, connect. Notice what's on somebody's desk and ask them about it as an iceberg. Number five, expand. Socialize with everyone on your team so there's no hint of favoritism. Number six, keep it classy. Drink in moderation. And discuss only neutral topics at work functions. Number seven, unplug. Give LinkedIn a rest periodically and telephone your contact. And number eight, check in after you meet someone, follow up within 24 hours of your call, email, or text. Well, I went more than the 16 minutes or 15 minutes I thought earlier. But this is just a little bit about what's propelled me in my career and gives you some sense of why I'm passionate about relationships. If you look again at, at my um, strength finder index, of my top 10 strengths, seven of them fall in the relationship bucket. Mm -hmm. So I'm very relational and I think that contributes to my ability to connect with people. You may not have that in your profile. That doesn't mean you can be can't be successful, but I would say surround yourself with people that have the, the um, strengths that you don't have. We always have to work on our weaknesses. I mean, you just have to. You know, I'd be a complete person without working on your weaknesses. So I'm not just saying stop working on your weaknesses. You'll have exponential growth. 